Well, praise God. God is good. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4 at verse 29. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Ephesians chapter 4 at verse 29. Ephesians chapter 4 at verse 29. And I think this is a very important word today. Ephesians 4 verse 29 basically says this. Let no unwholesome, unkind, or abusive word come out of your mouth. That's what it basically says. Rather, speak words that are wholesome and kind. Words that are useful for edification and building one another up. Words that are beneficial and give grace to the listener. That is basically what Paul is trying to convey to us. I would say that one of the things that many will experience in life is abuse and criticism. All kinds, all kinds. But one of the worst kinds of abuse and criticism, not the worst, but one of the worst kinds is mental and emotional abuse. Specifically, I'm talking about abuse inflicted by another person. Or, sad to say, abuse that we inflict on others by the power of our spoken word. You see, the words we speak to other people, the words we speak to a friend, a spouse to a spouse, even a parent to a child, the words we speak are important. Now, some might say, what do you mean? How do the words others say to us equate with mental and emotional abuse? Well, let me say this. If you have ever been the receiver of verbal abuse, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Exactly. It's the continual, the systematic diminishment and destruction of your self-esteem, your self-worth and your dignity by someone else. It's the tearing apart and the shredding of your soul and your spirit, and even your humanity to the point where you consider yourself worthless. You consider yourself a good for nothing, of no value. As a person, as a spouse, or even a friend or a child, you consider yourself nothing. A wife was continually abused by her husband day after day, year after year. She went to a psychologist, and one day the psychologist said this, what do you want in life right now more than anything else? She thought about it, what do I want right now more than anything else in my life? She said this, I wish that everything I'm experiencing on the inside would become evident on the outside. And then maybe, maybe my husband could see with his own eyes all the horrific pain and the hurt and the suffering and the damage he's causing in my life. What was she saying? She's basically saying destructive words can hurt and last longer than any physical pain. Now, isn't that true at times? Like a bullet, words that are shot into us can tear us apart. And just like real bullets... It doesn't take a lot. It takes only one word, one bullet sometimes, one word to shatter and tear us apart on the inside. Words like stupid, mm -hmm. worthless, mm -hmm. ugly, mm -hmm. dumb, and so many others. And when the words are combined together, they have the power like a rapid fire rifle to totally and completely destroy us, no matter who we are, or what our age, or what our situation. You're a loser. I wish you were never ever born. As far as I'm concerned, you don't exist. You're dead to me. How many of you know what I'm talking about here? You've heard words like that in your life. You'll never amount to a hill of beans. You're good for nothing. I wish I had aborted you when you were born. On and on and on. Some even Christians have heard those words, and unfortunately some Christians have even used those words to destroy other people. The Bible is right. 
life and death are in the power of the tongue and the power of the spoken word. Even those in the world recognize this. Even believers who have never in their life even lifted a Bible, read one Bible verse, understand this principle. One noted UCLA psychologist, one noted UCLA psychologist said this. Words do have power. This is what somebody in the world said. Words do have power, incredible power. In fact, words are singularly the most powerful force available to humanity. And with this force, he continued, we have two options. We can constructively use this force with words of encouragement and uplifting. Or we can use this force destructively and bring heartache and despair into the life of someone else. And he continued, words are extremely powerful, perhaps more than we even know, and have the energy to help or to hinder, to bring healing or to bring hurt, to lift up or to tear down. Look, this is what somebody in the world said. Somebody who doesn't know God said this. What a shame. The one thing God has given us to worship him with the one thing God has given us to praise Him with, the tongue, the tongue. The one thing God has given us to build others up with, to build the church up with, to bring healing and restoration and deliverance to people. We use that one thing, the tongue, the spoken word, to tear down, to humiliate, to even destroy. So then, is it any wonder that God said that the tongue can be compared to a restless evil force fueled by the fires of hell. Does this apply to born-again believers? Well, it's in the Bible, isn't it? Does this apply to born-again believers? Can this apply to somebody you're sitting next to right now? Can this apply to somebody listening right now? Yes! Absolutely, positively. Without question. Why? Why? Because believers are not exempt from imposing or inflicting the pains and sufferings and abuses of the spoken world on other people. In fact, one survey said that approximately 40% of those sitting in the pew on any given Sunday morning, 40%! Four out of every ten sitting in the pew on any given morning are unfortunately either currently suffering this kind of abuse or the long-term effects from this kind of abuse. For those who have or are suffering verbal abuse, make no mistake about this. Unlike the wounds and bruises and black and blues that often come from physical abuse that usually heal over time. Those negative words that we have heard, sometimes even as a child, can be so hurtful that we keep hearing them even as adults, echoing in our mind over and over and over. It's like, it's like a life sentence without parole. God bless my mom. My mom went through a lot in her life. She had cancer of the throat when she was younger. She had breast cancer as she got older. And sometimes she wasn't in her right mind. She had a marriage that wasn't the best. I remember as a little kid, my mom and dad never spoke to each other except in emergencies. I remember I would be sitting as a little kid watching the television. My mother would walk by and say, tell your dad supper is ready. She said to me something one day, to this day, asked my wife Mercedes, I still remember. She said, I wish I had drowned you when you were born. Now, I was a rotten kid. Make no mistake about that. I was a very rotten kid. And some would even say I deserve those words. But I can tell you this. I'm 73. And those words occurred probably 65 years ago. They're about. And I can still hear those words echoing in my mind from time to time. It's like a life sentence sometimes without parole. God bless her. She wasn't in her right mind, I'm sure, when she said that. So let's make this clear. When I talk about that voice in your mind, I'm not talking some, about some kind of crazy voice. I'm not talking about an unnatural voice. 
the voice of a madman, the voice of somebody. I'm talking about the memory of our subconscious mind that continually rises to the surface. Paul talked about this. He called it the spirit of our mind, Ephesians 4.23. Ladies and gentlemen, a person's life is on the line. I want to say it that way. Maybe even the life of someone we know, you know. A born-again, spirit-filled believer that we are. As spirit-filled, born-again believers that we are. We need to do all we can do with our power, with our voice, to save lives and not destroy them. No matter how hard the situation may be, no matter what your family's going through, no matter whom we're dealing with, we need to continually speak spirit-filled words over that person. Words that are wholesome and uplifting. Words that are designed to build up rather than tear down. You can always find something nice to say. Amen. The other day I got my driver's license renewed. And if you've ever had your driver's license renewed, one of the things you notice is you age over time. <laughs> and I said to my wife, Mercedes, I said, look at that picture, man. I wish I had pulled my, you know, because you know, you that. And she looked at me and she said, yeah, but Joe, look, look, look at the good point of all this. This is probably the last time you'll have to renew your license. <laughs> She encouraged me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's encouraging. God, the word. <laughs> Always find something good to say. We're on Sam's the other day. We're passing through the candy aisle. And I said, Man, I, I can eat that whole box of Butterfingers. Or uh, payday. Payday. Yeah, payday. Oh, yeah. I, she said, well, go ahead and buy a box. Said, no, 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 because I, I, I can't help it. I can't eat just one. And she said, come on, Joe. How long do you think you got left? <laughs> <Enjoy> <laughs> <it>. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Lord. Encourage you. Always want something good to say. She didn't mean it that way, but it, you know how it, it is. Came out. <laughs> we need to be encouragers and not discouragers because the one thing we don't want to be, now listen to what I'm saying. We need to be an encourager and not a discourager because the one thing you do not want to be is an accessory after the fact responsible for someone else's life filled with misery or worse a failing life so let me say it again we need to be encouragers and not discourages listen to what paul himself said first thessalonians 5 14. he said we urge you brothers and sisters basically this is what he's saying here encourage those who are lazy <laughs> encourage those who are faint-hearted and discouraged Encourage those who are disruptive and undisciplined. Help those who are weak. And he said, be patient. Be patient with everyone that you deal with. In a world that literally cries out discouragement. In a world where so many are discouraged so much of the time. Where depression and disillusionment are epidemic. Where so many are desperately needing, needing encouragement. One of the most important ministries a church can have, if I can say it this way, one of the most important ministries every person in every church can have is the ministry of encouragement. Now, sometimes you feel, sometimes you say, well, wait a minute, man, I don't feel like encouraging anybody else. And, you know, I can almost understand that. It's human nature to focus on our own problems. To focus on our own need. God, help me out of this situation. Get me out of this, Lord. I can't handle it anymore. Send somebody to assist me. To help my loved one, my friend, my family member. It's human nature. But when we accepted Christ, we took on his nature. And his spiritual nature is supposed to supersede our human nature. But sometimes as believers, we have to literally change our way of thinking. Instead of just looking to get something, we got to be looking for the other person. Sometimes we have to give something before we can get something. 
Sometimes we have to give something. You hear what I'm saying? Before we can get something. Sometimes we have to give encouragement before we can get encouragement. Listen again. I talked about this before. What Jesus said. Luke 6, 38. Listen to what he said. He said, give and then. Give and then it will be given to you. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. And running over, for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. One version puts it this way. Give, and you will receive. Your gift will return to you, fully pressed down and shaken together to make room for more. It will pour, pour into your lap, running over with more than enough. Now let me say this. This is not just a fancy phrase. This is not just a motto, a maxim, a slogan, a saying. The fact is, this is an irreversible promise of the Most High God. Spoken from the mouth of the Son of the Most High God, Jesus Christ himself. This is a God-given promise. The principle is, sometimes in order to receive, you must first give. And the promise is you will receive more than enough, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. But the key is this. You have to sow seeds of blood. Put it in context. Guys, it's not talking about, if it's talking about money, it's just a minuscule amount. Because ten verses before that, it says, Woe to you who are rich now, you've already received your reward in full. So pastors who use this verse to try to manipulate the congregation to give them money, they need to go back to Bible school. Put this in context. What is it talking about? Love, kindness, compassion, caring about other people. That's what it's talking about there. The key is, the key is this. You have to sow seeds of mercy and blessings and love and compassion and encouragement, not into your life, but into the lives of others who may also have that need. What did Jesus say? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. If you want God to give you what you need rather than you what you deserve, the key is sometimes you've got to show mercy to get mercy. Sometimes you have to give others what they need even when you don't feel like it. Listen. Listen, God knows your limitations. Would you agree with me on that? God knows your situation. God knows what you're going through right now. And God will never ask you to do what you cannot do. But he will ask you to do what you can do. Even what sometimes you may think you can't do. Even when you may not feel like it. There came a time when the Apostle Paul was in prison. In fact, he was very old to the point that his body was extremely weak. Huh? He even said that. He said, my, I feel like my body is being poured out. That's what he said. Check out the word. Poured out like a drink offering. He even said, my time of departure has come. Not only that, he was alone. All by himself in probably a cold, dark room in prison. Almost all his friends had abandoned him or deserted him. Paul certainly had good reason to focus on the negative. He certainly had a good reason to have a pity party. He certainly had good reason to say, I don't feel like encouraging anyone. Look at where I am. But what did Paul do? He no doubt thought. He no doubt thought. Well, wait a minute. I can indeed be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. No doubt Paul thought, I can indeed be more than a conqueror through him who strengthens me. Paul no doubt thought, I can indeed conquer any pity party feelings I may have for the cause of Christ. And instead of focusing on the negative and his situation, what do you do? He began to focus on the positive. He said, as long as I am trapped in this prison, what should I do? He said, while I'm here, I think I'm going to write a letter to my friends in Ephesus. And what did he tell them? Lift the veil that blinds you, because God can do exceedingly abundantly beyond your wildest hopes, dreams, imaginations, thoughts, 
prayers or desires because of the power of the Holy Spirit within you. What did he say? I think I'll write a letter to my friends in Colossae. And what am I going to tell them? Don't worry about the things below. Set your mind on things above and not the things below. He said, I think I'm going to write a letter to my friends at Philippi. And what did he tell them? Remember now, he's in a jail cell. And what does he say to them? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. In fact, four chapters, in four chapters, he used the word rejoice 16 times. Did he feel like it? Attitudes, ladies and gentlemen, don't just happen. You choose the attitude you have, even if you don't feel like it. I want to tell a true story. There was a Christian hairstylist named Lily Ann. Lily Ann's life was far from the best. She was going through many issues in her life, medical problems that continually needed monitoring. A major hair salon had just opened up down the street and not just had not just taken many of her clients away, but actually took away the other two hairstylists, hairstylists who were renting booths from her. What does that mean? She had to pay the rent herself. Had to pay everything herself. Yeah, her health was an issue. She was struggling to make ends meet. She could well lose her shop that she had been in for so many years. Emotionally and financially, she was at wit's end. Nevertheless, she always did her best to be kind to others, to encourage others, to make someone else's day, even when her day was not so good. And she told the story, Lillian told the story of how one day she got a phone call from a long-term client named Sally. Sally said, you know, I want to come in. I want to get my hair done. I have a very special occasion, appointment this night. I want you to do my hair as best as you can because I have a very important lifetime event this evening. In fact, she said, it's a once in a lifetime event. Sally was also one of the few people who really knew what Lillian, the hairstylist, was going through. She was one of the few people who knew. Okay? Follow what I'm going through? Nevertheless, during their time together, Lillian, the hairstylist, continually talked about the Lord. She continually talked about how good God was and how God had gotten her through many, many problems in her life. And she was sure would also get her through the problems she was currently suffering and going through. They even laughed, they joked, and at the end of the appointment, they both smiled at one another, gave each other a hug, and said goodbye. You know, I almost want to cry when I think about this. A few months later, Lillian, the hairstylist, got a letter from Sally. Sally said she had wanted her hair styled because indeed that particular evening, she had a once in a lifetime event planned. And she confessed that the one-time event was her own funeral. She told of how her life had gotten the best of her. She couldn't handle life anymore. She was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that night she planned to overdose. And so she wanted to be at her best when she was found. But Sally said to Lillian, after our time together, I felt so encouraged by you that I decided to start attending church. And eventually I even gave my life to the Lord and now I'm doing fine. She thanked Lillian for caring so much, even though she herself was going through so much. Without knowing it, she said, you gave me encouragement when I needed it the most, even when you didn't feel probably like giving it. Lillian was stunned. She had no idea Sally had been going through what she had been going through. She had no idea what she planned to do that very evening. And Lillian began to think, what if I had been a grouch? What if I had been like a grouch? 
because I got my own problems. She began to think, what if I had been so upset and distracted by, own, my, by, own, by my own problems that I never told her about the Lord, never told her what the Lord can do? What if I had treated Sally just like some other customer? Where would Sally be today? Did you follow what I just said to you, ladies and gentlemen? Lillian, the hairstylist, said, if I hadn't encouraged her, what would she have done that evening? Where would she have been this very moment? You never know what someone else is going through in life. To some people, the power of your encouraging words can make the difference between rising and failing, falling and succeeding. What you speak to another person can make the difference between depression and progression. There is indeed a power in the tongue, power in the words we speak, power in the spoken word. If that were not so, God would have not such, God would have not put such a premium, such an importance on the words that we speak. There is power in the spoken word especially when we use it to encourage and give hope to those who so badly need it. The confused, the downtrodden, the lost, those who have no aim in their life. Encouragement does have the power to strengthen and uplift and spur others on. It does have the power to motivate and regenerate, to tell somebody, yes, you can. Because the power of the Most High God lives within you. Don't let life get the best of you. Power, power in your spoken word. It can enrich other people, energize them, and uplift them. It can cause others to excel and succeed beyond their wildest expectations. You know, I think about my life. What if, if my life had changed and I had some of this when I was younger? What if someone had been there to encourage me? The words we speak can bring hope and restoration to one's, listen to me, emotional need, mental situation, their physical and their spiritual well-being as well. A person who gives words of encouragement is helping the other person become bolder and braver. By giving encouragement, you're adding courage. You're adding courage to that person, helping that other person to stand firmer and go farther. Even a dog, even a dog can be encouraged and the results can be amazing. One morning, a pastor opened his door. There was a little dog at the, at the door, and so he knelt down, he patted the dog on the head. Good boy. You, you know how you guys do that. Come on. Good boy. Good, 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 good boy. Good boy. Went and got some food, some chicken that he had the night before, fed the little dog. The next morning, the dog came back with the newspaper. <coughs> the pastor again knelt down. It's a good boy, good boy. Because you know how when they throw the newspaper, it didn't come right on the porch. Went and got the newspaper, brought it to the porch. Again, the pastor, but good boy, good boy. Went and got some other cold cuts that he had, gave it to the dog. The very next morning, there were 16 newspapers <laughs> on the pastor's porch. The dog had went and got newspapers from all the surrounding homes and brought them to the pastor. And the pastor spent the rest of the morning trying to figure out whose newspapers they were. Even a dog should be encouraged. Even a dog. A pastor had been at a particular church for many, you who are pastors, maybe you can, maybe you can identify here, you know. He had been a pastor at a certain church for many years, and finally he felt it was time to leave, and that very evening they had a farewell dinner for the pastor. And the pastor tried to encourage one of his deacons. He said, hey, listen, don't be sad that I'm leaving. Don't be sad. 
I'm sure the next pastor will be even better than me. The deacon looked at him in the face and said, yeah, well, that's what the last pastor said about you, but it keeps getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> Watch what you're thinking. <laughs> Listen, everyone needs a jump from time to time. Many of us know the experience of a dead battery, right? Yeah. Oh, Lord. Dead battery in the car. One solution is for another car to come alongside and hook up the jumper cables from a strong battery to a weak one, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Drawing the power from the other person's battery. Okay? Your battery will then become energized and able to start up because of the power of someone else's battery. Follow me? Now here's this an interesting thing. Do you know the Greek word for encourage? The Greek word for encourage is comforter. Did you know that? Referring to the Holy Spirit means one who comes alongside of you, apparently, to comfort you, to motivate you, to empower you. What am I saying? We have a Christian duty to encourage one another. Because everybody needs a jump from time to time. Many times just a word of praise, a word of thanks, a word of appreciation can give someone that extra spark they need to get through the day. God said through the Apostle Paul, Let no unwholesome, unkind, or abusive word come out of your mouth but rather speak words that are wholesome and kind to others. Words that are useful for edification and for building one another up. Words that are beneficial and give grace to the listener. With all due respect, with all due respect, and I mean this, maybe what we need in our homes and our churches today, now take this in context, maybe what we need is some more Spirit-filled Christian cheerleaders. Hmm. Please understand what I'm saying. We need more cheerleaders and less critics. Those who see over the heads of the naysayers and shout, go for it. You can make it. You can win the race that God has placed before you. Don't give up. Don't give up. We need people who are saved, who will be, will be willing to push us forward rather than pull us back. We need people who are willing to say words to build us up rather than destroy us. Hey, thank you for doing a good job today. Thank you for the great meal. Thank you for ministering to us today. Thank you for being there for us. But what are these? I'm, I'm finishing now. What are these? These are just words. Words words. They're just words on paper. They're absolutely no good unless they jump from the paper to our hearts and to our mouths. Unless we use them and make them the power of encouraging words that they are meant to be. They will always be just words on paper. I want to end with this thought. William Arthur Ward was an American writer. He wrote hundreds of articles and poems. In one of his works, he said this, Flatter me, and I may not believe you. Criticize me, and I may not like you. Ignore me, and I may not forgive you. But encourage me, and I'll never forget you. Which are you? Are you a flatterer? A criticizer, an ignorer, or an encourager. Ladies and gentlemen, lives are on the line. And you never know that the words you speak to somebody else can not just save their spiritual life, but their physical life as well. Amen?